On this episode of Kibbe on Liberty, we talk to an actual doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Singer. He's not a politician about how to solve the opioid crisis. Trigger warning, we're going to advocate legalizing all the drugs. different numbers throughout the day, but we had a very good turnout. Probably about 130, 140 in that room at any given yeah, time. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Singer, tell me tell me who you are. You're a practicing surgeon. Yeah, I'm a general surgeon in private practice. I've been practicing for 37 years, actually. Grew up and trained in New York City, but I moved to Phoenix, Arizona 40 years ago, and I've been uh, grew a practice, and I'm still in practice, and in the last few years I've scaled back my practice because I've always had this interest in uh, public policy for years, and I'm, I'm, at, I'm also at, at the moment a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Yeah, so you, you were, we, were ta- we were just talking about a conference at Cato, and we'll get more into it later, but uh, what was the headline of the conference that you organized yesterday? Well, uh, the headline was Harm Reduction is a mainstream approach to the to the, uh, the the drug death problem. I don't like to call this an quote unquote opioid crisis. I think that's uh, totally misleading, misdirecting. We have a drug overdose problem, and it's been increasing. Um, and a lot of our people in the media and in policy, the world of policy, seem to think this is a simple thing. It's due to doctors who overprescribed opioids to people in pain, and then. They got our young, innocent patients hooked and, be, and, and, and condemned to the streets as drug addicts. Couldn't be further from the truth, which explains why that as prescriptions have been driven down these last couple of years by the government, doctors are going to jail, they're afraid to prescribe, and patients are going back to medieval times in terms of the way their pain is being managed. They're basically told, being told to suck it up. Um, the overdose rate continues to climb because the, the former never attorney general literally told us to <clears throat> to put a stick between our teeth, right, and and just just bear the pain. When when uh, when I heard that, I had this little fantasy seriously, saying, "Gee, I'd love to operate on him." Yeah. And then when he asks me to give him something for pain, I'll say, "No, just uh, take an aspirin." Yeah, I was I was thinking about this in the context of being a patient myself, and I, I get pretty worked up about this because I've. I've been a uh, benefactor, a beneficiary, I guess would be the right word, of opioids. I've, I've had major surgeries for, for cancer, and, and, and over the last 20 years, the consequences of those first surgeries. Um, and I can't imagine how I would survive without pain management, with, without you know acute pain, chronic pain, all that stuff is a very personal thing for me. So I thought what we would do today is... Uh, You'll be the doctor and I'll be the patient. And we'll try to walk people through the political hysteria that's happening here in Washington, okay. D.C. And I got to read, I got to start with a tweet because you're, you're saying that you don't want to call it an opioid crisis, but uh, presidential candidate and Democratic Senator Gillibrand uh, disagrees. She, she is so focused on this, that she's come up with legislation that would limit, limit opioid prescriptions for acute pain to seven days. At least, apparently, she knows the difference between acute and chronic pain. That's, I guess that's good news. One could assume. I don't know. Yeah, we, when she went to medical school, they may have yeah. given a different definition. So she's, she's, uh, she's not a doctor, but she's a senator, which, which clearly makes her smarter about health care Right. And you, and I she mean, might have even stayed at a Holiday Inn Express, yeah, once or twice. Yeah, yeah. maybe that's what it was. Yeah. But she's getting a lot of flack for that, which made me happy because because it seems like both Republicans and Democrats, the Trump administration, has declared a war on opioid abuse. Um, it's it's a national emergency. Everything now is an emergency. Um, but you think they got it all wrong? I, not only do I think it, I know it. You know they got it wrong, and it's in the data. Uh, and this isn't cherry so why, picking. Why is there this not is an government data. Crisis. Government. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, at the, according to the latest numbers from the CDC, seventy-five percent of overdose deaths 
in the most recent year that we have numbers for, 2017, were from either fentanyl or heroin. Out of the percentage of the overdose deaths that involved any prescription pain reliever, 68% of those had other drugs on board like cocaine, alcohol, tranquilizers, fentanyl, heroin. So if you wanted to limit it to just the, the prescription painkillers alone, it's less than 10% of the overdose deaths. So we're busy trying to focus all of our energy on getting doctors to, to under-medicate their patients who are in pain yeah. in hopes that that's going to stop the overdose problem when the, the users of drugs in a non-medical setting, they've moved on from prescription pain relievers years ago. I mean, that's so 20th century. I, and they're still, so they're, they're still fighting the last war, so to speak. Um, and the fact is that uh, if you looked at the government's own numbers, in fact, I, I published on this in a, in a peer-reviewed medical journal in February, the Journal of Pain Research. The, gov- the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which started in the year 2002, it's taken by the government. And if you look at the uh, uh, past month's non-medical use of prescription pain reliever by adults from 2002 through 2014, after which they changed their questionnaire, straight line, essentially. Also, past year diagnosed with pain reliever use disorder between 2002 and 2014, straight line. Number of prescriptions written per 100 population between 2002 and 2014, doubled. So what does that tell you about the relationship between the numbers of prescriptions that doctors write and the non-medical use or abuse? There is obviously no relationship. Meanwhile, there is, I think, a relationship in the other direction because from 2008 to 2017, the, the uh, number, percentage of, of prescriptions that are high dose opioids that were written has come down 58% because of the government. Yeah. And overall, opioid prescriptions have come down 29%. What's happened to the overdose rate? It keeps going up. So prescriptions are coming down. Deaths are going up. Yeah. Meanwhile, the relationship between prescriptions and non-medical use or abuse disorder, is there is none. So this, all you have to do is have a rudimentary mathematical appreciation. You can see that um, it seems like our making the prescription rates come down is driving the non-medical users of diverted prescription pain relievers over to other options, much more deadly, dangerous options. Yeah. So, so our policy is actually driving up the death rate. And in the meantime, people who need it for pain, people who are recovering from surgery, have chronic pain syndrome, they're getting denied it. Yeah. And some of them are getting desperate, and they're turning to the dangerous black market to find relief. Some are even committing suicide. It's, it's insane policy, and it's because it refuses... The policymakers refuse to see that the so-called opioid crisis, which really now is a fentanyl crisis, but wait, about two years from now, we're going to be talking about the meth crisis again because that's back big time. But it's always been, it's just been the latest kind of expression of the drug war. Uh, uh, Really, uh, we had a a conference at the Cato Institute yesterday, and uh, the dean of the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health was our keynote. And he, his group did a study that was very revealing. They looked into CDC numbers going back to the 70s. And what they concluded was that the, in this country, there's been this continued exponential increase in the non-medical use of licit and illicit drugs since the 70s. It's been inexorable. Those are his words. Shows no sign of deviating from the trend. There's no reason to believe that it's going to slow down anytime soon. The only thing that's changed over the decades is which drugs come in and out of vogue. So that in the 70s and 80s, it was heroin as soldiers come back from Vietnam with a heroin habit. Then it became cocaine. Then it became Vicodin. Then it became prescription opioids. Now it's, then it became heroin. Now it's fentanyl. Now meth is coming back. Uh, almost 11,000 meth-related deaths last year. All-time high. So basically, uh, you could say more and more people in society... Uh, some, I, I would argue, probably a lot of them are self-medicating. There could be a, a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons. There's no simple explanation, but there are a lot of reasons why more and more people are using drugs in a, in a non-medical setting, both le- legal and illegal drugs, and um, people are taking increased risks with these drugs. But all our policy is doing is just making sure that whatever they're doing is more dangerous. Well, let, let's walk through this logic that, that the war on opioids certainly didn't start with the Trump administration. I think you just said 20 plus years that we've uh, public policy has been 
um, uh, to to suppress and 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 limit the amount of of, of prescriptions and, and and legally obtained opioid painkillers. Is that right? When did when did it start? Oh, it started when I was even before I was a medical student. It goes back to Nixon. I mean, the, the most modern iteration would be Richard Nixon's yeah. war on drugs. I, I love to blame Nixon, but but that's when the <laughs> war on drugs really started yeah, in right, earnest. Right. And he, by the way, and this I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but he he very explicitly viewed it as a way to rally his base and 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 target uh, black people. Right. In fact, yeah. most prohibition over the centuries, would you say, yeah. has has had racial involvement. You know. Cocaine was about black people. Cocaine crazed Negroes, I think, was the word they used back in the early 20th century. Opiates or opioids, opium was really aimed at the Chinese who were using opium and had opium dens. Uh, alcohol prohibition had a lot to do with going after the Irish, Irish immigrants. Yeah, there's a whole lot of that that's part of it. Yeah, marijuana, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And but but let's, I mean. Let, let's put aside the, the cynical politics of the war on drugs and let, let's just talk about, about cost benefits and unintended consequences. Basically, what you're arguing is that the more we do to fight opioid addiction by making it more difficult for patients and doctors to make those pay decisions for themselves, uh, the worse the problem has gotten. Clearly. And, 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 yeah. and what happens is uh, legal opioid use goes down by definition, because mm -hmm. they're they're you, you just mentioned earlier that that a, a doctor actually got a lifetime prison sentence right, for just prescribing recently. opioids. Yeah. Um, so what's the natural incentive? I, I'm not going to do that anymore, um, even right. if my patient needs it. Right. We doctors hear those stories and they say, "Oh, I'm just going to stay away from prescribing." So if opioids. you're addicted, if you're trying to manage pain and your doctor can't help you, where do you go? You go to the illegal market, and the second tranche was heroin. And now we're dealing with fentanyl, which mm -hmm. is absolutely a super dangerous Well, super drug. potent. Yeah, super potent. Yeah, actually fentanyl is, is illicit. Well, it's, it's a legal drug. Sure. Now the fentanyl that's being used is referred to as illicit fentanyl. And the DEA will stipulate to this that over 99% of the fentanyl they seize is not manufactured pharmaceutical fentanyl. The fentanyl we use in a medical setting Usually it's in an injectable form. We use it for anesthesia. We use it uh, most of the time intravenously for really seriously ill patients in the hospital. And then there are some forms that are really not useful for uh, recreational use, like these skin patches where a tiny amount gets absorbed through the skin over a few days because it's very potent. Yeah. Um, but the fentanyl that's, that's being used in uh, recreationally, so to speak, is uh, it's manufactured in clandestine labs, a lot of them in Southeast Asia, China, now in Mexico, and it uh, comes in a lot of times through the mail. People order it on the on the dark web. It gets delivered through the U.S. Postal Service, sometimes through FedEx or American or uh, UPS, and um, uh, then there are these uh, d dealers who have pill presses, and they actually press them into counterfeit. Uh, prescription opioids. In fact, that's how Prince died. You, you might have read he, uh, the coroner's report found he liked to recreationally use Vicodin. Uh, records show he never ever once went to a doctor, again, dispelling that whole myth. Yeah, yeah. His dealer got him Vicodin for him. So his dealer got him some Vicodin, but turns out it was really not Vicodin. It was fentanyl that had been pressed into counterfeit Vicodin. Unknowingly, he took it and overdosed because it's so powerful. Yeah, just just a massive dose that he didn't yeah. know he was taking. Exactly. And that and that that is that is the problem there in the illicit market is you don't yeah. know exactly what you're taking. And it's the iron law of, of prohibition, right? Uh, prohibition tends to make it, it creates economic incentives to develop more potent forms of whatever is prohibited. It also allows you to s smuggle in in smaller amounts and easier to escape detection. I mean during alcohol prohibition they weren't smuggling in beer or wine, they were smuggling in spirits, right. whiskey. Well, it's the same thing with the crack cocaine probably wouldn't have developed was enough for cocaine prohibition. Um, at our conference yesterday, uh, Professor Daniel Ciccarone from UC San Francisco, he's a, a, a world noted addiction medicine expert. He, and he's been doing a study for the NIH on, uh, it's called the Heroin in Transition Study, where they're actually spending time, almost, it's almost anthropological. They're on the streets around the country 
uh, this kind of talking with and interviewing street living heroin addicts, trying to kind of get inside their heads because as a physician who treats addiction, he believes that if we better understand what's going on inside their heads and what's in their, going on in their lives, it's going to better enable us to be able to treat their problems. And I think he's right. So he said that the majority of his interviewers, they tell him they don't like fentanyl. They don't want fentanyl. Um, it does. It's, there are some who enjoy fentanyl, but apparently it's a, it wears off very quickly, and it doesn't give you the kind of euphoric feeling that heroin does. So most of them are actually very disappointed when they find out that their heroin is laced with fentanyl because, uh, number one, it's making it more dangerous for them. They're going to be more, have more of a tendency to overdose. And number two, it's not the high they're looking for. Um, so... It's basically a, an economic thing. Yeah. As, as fentanyl became available, dealers in, in the drug cartels uh, have been using it because it allows them to package the, the smuggled in heroin in smaller yeah. numbers, smaller it's, amounts. It, the, the whole thing is a basic lesson in supply and demand, and, and maybe we can walk people through the economics. But let's let's go back to um, there. there is... Uh, not just Dr. Um, self-anointed Dr. Gillibrand, and and by the way, she has a Republican co-sponsored, Cory Gardner, Corey Gardner and, and he I'm apparently sorry. got his medical degree when we weren't looking. Well, we've got to be bipartisan yeah. critics. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he at least Googled something, right? So that that's good. But right. the um, there are a lot of 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 self-anointed. Uh, doctors in the political class. It's a bipartisan thing. Both both parties think they know better than doctors. So let's, for them, in case they're watching, why don't we walk through some of the uh, uh, legitimate and even essential uses for painkillers when it comes to your business? Sure. Surgery, and we could talk about the difference between acute and chronic pain. But these these are these are important things if if you care about people's health and and recovery. And, and lives. Yeah, people take for granted how actually how recent and modern is the surgical experience we have today. I mean, it wasn't until the mid 1800s that we developed anesthesia. So there was a time when we basically hold somebody down and just cut them open, yeah. give them a stick in their mouth like uh, Attorney General Sessions wanted us to do, yeah. and maybe give them a bunch of alcohol to try to get them drunk. Which yeah, just take a, a take yeah. a swig of whiskey, right? Uh, like yeah, in the cowboy movies. Yeah. and then then anesthesia got invented, and then that got refined as well and became safer. And uh, as early as the early twentieth century, there were just a handful of of uh, drugs available to treat pain, all derivatives of the opium plant. Yeah, um, and and even to this day, there um, the 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 derivatives of the opium plant operate in the central nervous system to suppress pain. They also do some other things. Uh, in the medical setting, we use it for its pain relief aspect, but it also creates a, a, a euphoric feeling for a lot of people. Some people don't like it, it but for some people, they like the feeling of them. And it, it, they also, to different degrees, depending on the, on the type of opioid, uh, could suppress the respiratory center. That's where the overdose comes in, because uh, opioids in general don't have nearly the uh, harmful effects on the on the organs that, for example, alcohol or tobacco do. Um, they don't cause liver damage, kidney damage, brain damage. They do cause long-term use can cause constipation. Uh, it could cause some hormonal changes, which could affect uh, osteoporosis. But those are kind of manageable things. Um, but if, uh, like with any drug, or with, like with many drugs, you could develop a dependency. Um, and that's what a lot of people um, tend to, by the way, a lot of the, the politicians don't understand. It's the difference between, be, be, between developing a physiologic dependency, which happens with lots of drugs, including beta blockers, antidepressants, and addiction, which is a, a compulsive uh, driven disorder that's actually a disease that has a genetic component. So getting back to the opioids, uh, scientific study after scientific study, we're talking about recent studies, huge studies from respected medical centers show in the medical setting the the overdose potential the overdose rate from o opioids is anywhere from 0.01% to 0.04% that's the range so basically it's about the same danger as taking an aspirin a day uh, as far as the addiction potential is concerned and this isn't just me talking this is the National Institute on Drug Abuse now we're talking about addiction 
not dependency. Addiction, anywhere, depending on which study you read, is anywhere from about a 1% addiction rate to maybe a 3 to 5% addiction rate. Suffice it to say, it's extremely, to quote Dr. Noral Valkow, uh, para, or paraphraser from the National Institute on Drug Use, uh, even with, in people with pre-existing vulnerabilities, addiction in the medical setting is very rare. Meanwhile, we got all of these policymakers uh, acting under the assumption that overdose potential is very great and addiction potential is very great. So it actually, I'm all, as, a, as a doctor, I'm always uh, saying if you can come up with another pain reliever that may even have uh, less of the negatives, because everything's got, you know, it's, there's two sides to everything. So everything you come up with has got its, its potential for complications or yeah. Uh, side effects. If you come up with something new, I'm I'm w- willing to take a look at it. I'd love it if you can. But right now, opioids are actually pretty effective pain relievers. Yeah. And there's not a lot of stuff that works better so, for severe like, pain. And I, I am a I'm a patient of of uh, a, a former cancer patient, and I've had three or four major surgeries. I got I got the scars to prove it. And and what I learned just as a patient was that pain management is a key piece of, of, of recovery. Like you, you don't necessarily get better if you're suffering and in, in brutal pain, your body doesn't, but doesn't respond to that. So, so pain management is one of the things that matters to, as to whether or not people get better. Absolutely. And, and we're not talking about that. Uh, we're we're ta- uh, Dr. Gillibrand, candidate for president Mm -hmm. uh another political demagogue and i shouldn't just pick on her because i think i think i could pick on um 80 percent of the members of the u.s senate and and, probably almost all the governors in the united states (laughs) i'm just i'm just obsessed with her tweet right now but um they don't seem to understand i'll I'll pick on jeff sessions because he's easy to pick on and he just seems to not have any idea what he's talking about and happily he's no longer the attorney general but when he was describing um his efforts to uh, get people to replace uh, opioids with aspirin or a stick. Um, he didn't seem to understand the difference between acute and chronic pain. Right. Um, but I can tell you as, a, as, a, as someone that had serious acute pain after surgery, uh, I'm not sure I would have wanted to try to do it without opioids. A stick would not have cut it. Um, so from, from a health perspective, if we just care about patients, um, the idea that you would arbitrarily set limits on on what a doctor can do to manage their pain is offensive to me. It's it's like this is this is bad. This is really bad. And 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 you know, pain just like everything else in medicine. When you're dealing with humans, there's lots of variations. So different people experience pain at different levels, and different people require different amounts of medication to control their pain. And there's a lot of a lot of uh, Factors involved, their kidney function, their liver function, how much body mass they have, their age. Yeah. You could take an elderly person and give them a mild opioid and it could have them almost like completely knocked out. You can't even get them to open their eyes for four hours. But then an- another person who's younger, that it doesn't touch them. It's like just like giving them sugar, a sugar pill in terms of it. So we doctors know that and we yeah. like to be able to say, you know, kind of Based what we prescribe in what amount and combination with whatever, based upon what we know about our patient, what we know about the particular situation, and then of course there's also uh, you know there's a psychological overlay. People handle pain. There's an interplay between the psyche and the physics, physical pain in terms yeah. of how you handle it. But if you don't have your pain well managed, it's going to affect your recovery, which could affect your health again. You know, if you're not mobile, you can get complications of being immobile. Yeah. So, so the the double whammy here, and, and I'll I'll reference. Uh, um, we just we've been following a friend of ours, uh, a guy named Joel Davis, who was was born with with uh, a lot of problems, but particularly scoliosis. He has a double curved spine, has dealt with with chronic pain his entire life, and he had been on a sort of a ratcheting up effect, uh, a ratcheting up prescription of opioids over the last 10 years or something. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll butcher the number. And and it was affecting his health and it was affecting, and, and it wasn't really working anymore. He was still in pain and he was getting all the downside uses of that. And he decided to use medical cannabis to, to wean himself off of that. But in his state, that's illegal. Right. So here's a, here's a guy that decided for himself, and, and, he, and by the way, he successfully went through this process, 
Um, he decided to do that for himself, and the government is telling him that he's a criminal. So we have these two these two wars on drugs um, that 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 seem to clash with each other. Because you you could argue, I, don't, I wonder what your opinion is, but it strikes me that that medical cannabis is certainly less addictive. Yeah. And then opioids, particularly this sort of illegal, dangerous opioids that, that we're talking about. And you know, what the, super o- you know what the overdose rate is from cannabis? Zero. Zero. Yeah, you cannot overdose on it. It's interesting, in our conference yesterday, we had a, a Professor uh, Adrian P- a Wilson Poe from Washington University. She's a, a researcher in the, in the uh, medical school in the pain department, but she's a PhD and done a tremendous amount of real serious research on cannabis. Um, and she's world renowned, and she was presenting a lot of her data. Um, there's clear relationship in pain management between cannabis. Cannabis seems to, number one, it has a synergistic effect with opioids, so that uh, there's a lot of strong evidence that your opioid requirement re- is reduced in conjunction with cannabis because they work together to control your pain. But even by itself, it has it, it has pain relieving features. You know, we can get a, we could talk about the science, uh, but to me, on a more fundamental level, and, and this this is really what animates me from the get go. Um, I just you talk about you you find the offen- I find it offensive that someone else can decide what I say works for me and yeah. what I could put into my own body. Yeah. If it's not affecting the rights of others, this you know, then then even if I'm Personally, my belief is even if I'm making a bad decision for myself and putting something bad into my body, that's my business. And uh, talk about the ultimate offense is anybody trying to presume to tell me what gives me relief from my pain and what I can put into my body. That's at the end of the day, that's the the real issue. Hundred percent, and hundred percent, and I think uh, that, of course, is the, the libertarian case for. Um, me controlling my own destiny, making my own choices, taking responsibility for those actions. Um, and, but of course, here in Washington, no one, no one believes in that. But you thing. talk about f- people talk; they throw the term "fascist" around all the time. Yeah, you know, this this person's a fascist. That person talk about the ultimate fascist act right. is to say you can't have more than seven days of pain relief because I don't think you need any more than that. Right. That's the ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. Who do they think they are? Yeah, and it's just so arrogant. It's the the, the Hayek called it a fatal conceit, but it's it's more than that. It's 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 morally offensive. Um, but you know, I think you know we as libertarians sort of instinctually get that. But but for for the rest of of the public, um, the challenge is to is to sort of get them to understand the facts, mm-hmm. get them to understand the unintended consequences of bad public policies. But also to focus on on Joel, or me, or any patient. Someone, you know, put yourself in my shoes, put yourself in Joel's shoes, and understand that the the brutal unintended consequences of of, of the drug war um, affect people, real people, real people. Well, even you know, even not patients. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of presentations at our conference uh, from some Canadian physicians where Canada is much more uh, humane in terms of the way they deal with, with people who have substance abuse problems. They have s- safe injection sites. They even have heroin-assisted treatment there. And we had uh, physicians who uh, run these authorized centers presenting. And um, when you think about it, most of those people who have these problems, who their lives have been destroyed because of their addictive problem and they're living on the streets, yeah. even those things are... Uh, externalities, so to speak, from the war on drugs. Because uh, I'll give you an example um, from medical history. William Halstead is considered the father of modern American medicine. He was a professor at Johns Hopkins in the early 20th century. He created the residency program as we know it. And uh, many of the early operations, still some operations, still carry his name. He was one of all time, he was like a legend. Well, we learned in, from his memoirs that for the last 15, 20 years of his life, he was a morphine addict. He came home and he injected. And then he would eject just enough in the beginning of the day to prevent him from going into withdrawal. And he had this very productive life. Now, I'm sure every one of us has 
interacted with people who we think might might we suspect might have a, a drinking problem you know they um, we see them drinking heavily and maybe when they show up in the morning for work they smell like they've been drinking um, and, but they function well and they're acting sober in our presence and then you know and if we care about them we may want to personally make an inquiry and offer you know to get them help if they want to take it but we're okay with that it, that's because it's, it's legal we're not destroying their lives but but when it's illegal we drive these people t- to the bad places to the underground where they don't know what they're getting their whatever they're purchasing could be impure laced with all sorts of terrible substances they have to take it in unsanitary s- settings so a lot of the condition that are that we that everybody in society laments these people living on the street who are addicts using IV drugs a lot of those people were it not for prohibition they might be like Dr. Halstead. They may be privately using IV drugs, yeah. but as far as the rest of the world is concerned, they're functioning members of society and it's none of our business, you know? And they're able to use it more safely. And then the other thing I think about, now this doesn't sound like a doctor, this sounds like a, like a, just a, a person talking here, but... Doctors uh, are people too. Yeah, yeah, but Some, I mean, sometimes. as a doctor, I might get like, uh, you know, so my, my colleagues might shake their finger at me, but why, you know, it, it, is it I mean what's wrong with people being addicted <laughs> you know unless they have a problem with it. if I have a patient who says I'm addicted and I, I don't want to be addicted can you help me well I'm here for that but if their addiction is not hurting anyone else and they are perfectly happy accommodating that to their life like when people are addicted to nicotine for example tobacco smoke or vaping or whatever so what? Why do we have to pizza. make sure that nobody's yeah. addicted to pizza? Yeah. You hear people say, I'm addicted to chocolate. I am actually a pizza addict. And <laughs> I, I can't go within 10 feet of one because really? it's, it's okay. just dangerous for me. All right. So well, yeah. luckily, it's not. It's still legal. So yeah. you could trust the pizza when you buy it yeah, at yeah. the shop. Yeah, so. I know what's in that pizza. Yeah. Yeah. But let's, uh, so let's, we, we've, we've referenced the conference a couple of times. Let's, uh, let's give a shout out to Cato. And, and just describe the, the basic premise of the conference and where people might watch it. Because if, okay. if, if people are interested in what we're talking about, or maybe they're skeptical and maybe they're angry at what we're saying, um, go, you got to check this whole thing out. You got to do a deep dive. Right. Okay. So there's a, a, a term called harm reduction. And uh, people who are interested in, in the whole drug issue have been uh, familiar with this concept. It goes back to the 1970s. And so the, the idea behind it is, uh, regardless of where you stand on whether a person should be using heroin or cocaine or whatever, uh, it, you take your personal judgment out of it, and you also stop deluding yourself into thinking that we're going to have a quote-unquote drug-free society. It's never going to happen because as far back as we can go in studying human history, people have dabbled in drugs. So the, 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 the war on drugs has been going on for a couple thousand years. Probably a couple thousand years. we're years. just about to win, finally. Well, actually, we only declared war on it about a hundred years ago. It was There was no war on drugs. It was just drugs, okay. drug use for thousands, for millennia. So we've only been losing <laughs> the war for a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And, and so the, the harm reduction p- proponents say, let's just Let's just put that argument aside about whether people should do drugs. Let's just let's just stipulate there's always going to be people doing drugs, and because um, uh, largely because of the fact that it's illegal, doing those drugs are extreme, uh, much more dangerous than they otherwise would be. And if the reason we uh, we we purport to be concerned about this issue is because it really upsets us to see all these people dying and all these people spreading around HIV and hepatitis and and things like that with needles then let's just focus on that. That's something that whether you're a drug warrior or not, we should all agree about that. Well, let's just see what we can do to reduce the harm that drug use, particularly in, in an underground market, does. So strategies such as needle exchange, where uh, I know you're going to be using IV heroin, so let me give you a clean needle so at least you don't give, you don't, when you share it, you're not spreading around hepatitis or HIV. Um, let me give you a test strip. By the way, in my state of Arizona, that's illegal, but the test strips that have been developed, just like for urine tests, to test to see if there's fentanyl in your heroin. 
which may make you decide either not to use that heroin or to use a lot less. Let me give you a test strip so that you're going to be less likely to overdose. Um, let me uh, give you naloxone, the, the antidote to an overdose, so that if you're with a buddy who you think is overdosing, you could save his life. These are harm reduction methods. Um, safe injection facility. If I can, if you, if you could see how giving out a clean needle and syringe is good. That's good as far as it goes. Eventually, that person is going to sell that needle and syringe to someone. How about if instead you come to my facility, I'll give you a clean needle and syringe to use in my facility, and then I'm going to take it back from you so you can't share it with anyone, but you can come back as often as you need to. I'll give you a new one each time, and I'm going to be standing right here with some naloxone, so in case you overdose, I'm here to save your life as opposed to you being all alone when you use this stuff. And then when a sense of trust develops... I might even say to you, hey, hey, buddy, you need some help. You know, I can get you into help if you want help with that habit. And you don't look at me as somebody threatening because you see I'm here for you. I'm not going to put you in jail. Yeah. And, and that's, that's called safe injection facilities or safe consumption sites. There's different names for them. Been around for 30 years. Every country in the world except the U.S., 120 major cities. In the United States, is illegal. Um, other forms of harm reduction are things like uh, let me switch you over to methadone or buprenorphine. And now there may be potential for cannabis. So uh, opponents of that would say, well, now you just got him from being addicted to heroin to be addicted to methadone. Well, not really because I got him to stop sticking dirty needles in his veins. I got him to stop going on a street where he's uh, in a world where there are criminals and violent people who may kill or, or mug him or whatever. Um, and I got, I got him using a pharmaceutical-grade, safe, predictable substance. And now that he's no longer concerned about going into withdrawal, which is a hellish experience, uh, he's able to get his life stabilized. And now, if he wants, we as we could talk about let's let's work on getting you off of this dependency on this drug. Uh, studies show, research shows that more than half of people who have addictive disease and it's a disease have what they call psychiatric comorbidities. They have other psychiatric problem that, and problems like ADD or bipolar disorder or uh, uh, clinical depression. And um, the notion that a person who has something like that going on at the same time as their uh, substance abuse disorder, that you could just, you know, rapidly taper them off and get them clean, that's dilute, you're diluting yourself. It may turn out that the, the, the therapist who's working with that person, if that person wants help, says, you know what, let's not even work on getting you off of this drug that you're dependent on right now. At least we got you now where you're not, you're, you're, you're not cognitively impaired and you're not on the streets and you're not st sticking dangerous needles in yourself. Let's work on your bipolar disorder. Let's get all those other things kind of, they're more pressing. Let, let's get them straightened out. This could wait, and we'll deal with this later. But these are all harm reduction techniques. And it's interesting, one of our presenters at the conference, Dr. Ciccaroni, he said, you know, harm reduction is not just limited to to mind-altering drugs. He says, you know, uh, diabetes, a lot of cases of diabetes, he's an internist, can be treated with, you know, weight loss, changing your diet, but there are a lot of people. And that's type B, right? Is that, yeah, is that yeah. getting it right? But yeah. there are a lot of people, and he also thought cholesterol. It's diet-induced it, sugar yeah. is, a, is a culprit there. But a lot of people say, I can't, this is a great analogy. Yeah. People say, you know, I know that, but I can't, I can't. I love yeah, to eat. I can't discipline myself. I'm not going to be able to lose weight. I'm not going to be able to do the exercise I need to do. I'm not going to be able to, that diet that, you, that I need to be on, I just will not stick to that. So then the doctor says, well, let's do some harm reduction. Let yeah. me put you on metformin to get your blood sugar down. In a way, a great m deal of what we do in medicine is harm reduction. When you think about all of the lifestyle uh, activities that in modern society are causes of health problems, overeating. We can just talk about the bad choices I made yesterday. Yeah. I, I need some harm reduction So, here. But that, isn't that, yeah. in many respects, so much of what we treat in, yeah. in a modern affluent society are basically complications of lifestyle decisions we make, whether it's to, because we, you know, we haven't been physically active enough or we haven't been eating right or, you know, a whole host of things, uh, let alone alcohol or tobacco, high cholesterol, you know, taking a statin drug for your high cholesterol is, yeah. as opposed to diet control. That's a form of harm reduction. Yeah. So, so the, uh, just to finish this loop, the, the Cato conference was basically a scientific conference. Scientific if you, if you want conference. To put, Put away sort of the the moral case that people should not do drugs. 
and sort of get into the the science and the right. healthcare and have a rational conversation. You you brought a bunch of scientists right. together, and that whole conference, uh, Logan was there, um, and he he said it was. I hope was, you liked it. Was pretty fantastic. Logan, thumbs up, thumbs yeah, down. Yeah, great. Yeah, my whole idea was the the harm reduction uh, strategy or philosophy has been around, like I said, since the seventies, and there are a lot of really quality organizations out there that have been trying to get yeah. get it off the ground in this country. In this country, unfortunately, a whole lot of people are saying, well, I see the public health benefits, I see all that, but you're still letting people do a bad thing, so I can't buy into it. So that's why it's had a hard time getting accepted in this country. So I thought, you know, I'm a doctor. I'm used to going to medical meetings. Oftentimes they're kind of dry, scientific meetings where you know, really? professors are presenting their they're, papers. They're dry, are they? They could, yeah. they could be. Like a, I've, I've been to academic economist conferences. And yeah, they could be. Yeah. On the other hand, if it's some field that you're really interested in, you can yeah, find yeah. yourself very excited about it. And so I thought, you know, let's take the advocacy label off, out of it and all that. Let me, let me get scientists, clinicians, researchers who uh, have data. Yeah. And, and, and they don't have a, a reputation as being, you know, out there as advocates, but they're just... They work in this, and they have data. And let's just present it that way. I think that way it kind of takes the, hopefully it takes the biases and emotions out of it and just gets people to look at the facts. And so I think that's what I accomplished. Um, yeah. And uh, I, was, I myself learned a lot from it because they were, the people uh, that I was able to get to come to this are leaders in, in, in those fields. And so I myself was, even though I was moderating a number of the panels, yeah. I found myself really enjoying listening to that. I, I, love, I love the framing of it, and it, get, and it gets back to uh, the question of whether or not we're, we're, we're caring about patients, real patients, and, and how public policy impacts them uh, versus the, the sort of the, the demonization of people that just shouldn't do drugs. And I won't, I, won't, I won't call them out until I get them on the show, but one of my colleagues here at CRTV, um, and I'm sure there's more than one, uh, conservatives will say people shouldn't do drugs. We should have zero tolerance. It's just not. It's morally wrong to do drugs. And I think I think we should should have that debate because there's certainly people like that. Yeah. Um, and and it's almost. I mean, it's almost an emotional position they have. And and I wonder how many more failures we need before people say, you know yeah. what? Even if I feel that way, it's not working. Uh, but let's talk about the Portugal model because they took yeah. the harm reduction approach to things, and and the um, I, I I was about to say unintended consequence, but I, I don't think that's right. I think the natural consequence of decriminalizing all of this behavior and focusing on harm reduction did all of the things that my conservative friends would like to see: right. fewer young people doing drugs. T tell everybody about the, okay. the the Portugal model. Yeah, in fact. Uh Cato, uh, Glenn Greenwald did a, a big policy analysis for, for the Cato Institute on this. I think it was in 2011 or so. You could see it on our yeah, website. Yeah, I've, re I've read it, and it's, it's worth reading. It really goes into the detail. Yeah. Very well uh, researched. But uh, if, if you uh, read the, uh, um, the reports from their, you know, Portugal's health minister at the time, uh, they didn't say we're throwing in the towel on a war on drugs. They, he actually said... It, we just came to the realization that what we're doing is not working, and we want to see less people dying from drug use. So let's see if this works. That basically it was just a pragmatic thing. Yeah. And at that time, around they tried two, everything else. Yeah. Let's, not working. Let's see. let's get really crazy yeah. and try a little bit of freedom and right. But twenty years later, we still are, are not thinking that way in this country. Right. So at that time, they had the highest overdose rate in, in Europe. And this is like the late 1990s? Yeah, 2001 is when they switched, though. Yeah, and yeah, they so. totally decriminalized all drugs. So let's talk about the 90s first. Um, they, were, they were sort of the hellhole of, yeah. of uh, death and, and, and addiction and, and disease. Uh, worst by EU standards, is that right? Right, the worst yeah. in, in the EU. Yeah. So they totally decriminalized all drugs. Um, and uh, I think they still go after, you know, big-time heavy smugglers, but... The street dealers or the small time, they just, no, there's no penalty. Yeah. Um, and the efforts that they it's had. It's not been, legal, but it's it's not right. criminal. Now, from a political standpoint, I could see how that's easier to pull off. Because sure. if you say it's legal, then you're saying, oh, so you're condoning this? Yeah. 
Um, whereas if you say it's decriminalized, you're saying we're not condoning it, but we're not going to punish you. So, and and uh, a lot of the funds that have been going towards putting people in cages got used towards expanding um, harm reduction programs available. And what they found uh, by, you know, I think 2015, I think is the most recent data that I'm aware of from there, it's probably more recent, um, the number of, of known heroin addicts in the country dropped 75 percent. 75 percent. Yeah. And uh, they now have the lowest overdose rate in, in Europe. Uh, the last numbers I saw, they had six overdoses per, per million population, as opposed to the U.S., which had 312 per million with our policy. Um, the teenage drug use rate uh, didn't come down, but it didn't go up either. It just kind of kept on the same pace with the teenage drug use in the rest of Europe. But they didn't see it go up, as critics said was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what they found is that, you know, actually adult use has gone down and, and overdoses have gone down. And, and, and it's been such a success that uh, the Norwegian legislature recently voted uh, to uh, order its executive branch to start working on it, um, developing a decriminalization program for Norway, similar to that that exists in Portugal. Hopefully, it'll start to catch on more and more. But even outside of Portugal, if you look at the rest of Europe and the developed world, uh, data shows they have, people don't realize this, but they have a drug problem there too. Uh, particularly bad in Spain, the UK, um, Sweden. Uh, in, in the Scotland area, they have a, their biggest problem is benzodiazepines like Xanax. But there's, like, like the University of Pittsburgh study has shown, there's this, this exponential increase in self-medication going on and not non-medical use. But the reason the overdoses in the rest of the developed world, Canada, Australia, the EU, are, is lower than it is here is because in those countries for decades, they've been much more uh, um, open to the idea of harm reduction. And they've been much more selective in who they're going to put in jail and, and, and what crimes they're going to prosecute. They've been, I guess the term is, they've been exercising prosecutorial discretion. And a story that, I'm a big jazz lover. And a story that comes to my mind, uh, many people may have seen this movie with Ethan Hawke about Chet Baker yeah. called Born to be Blue. Yeah, I have. So here's a guy who was a, a, a great artist and he loved what he did. And he had he was a true addict. The reason you know he's a true addict because every time he would be detoxed, he'd go back. Yeah. And he knew it was ruining his personal life and his professional life but because that's a, it's a compulsive disorder. So eventually he moved to Amsterdam where he spent the next 20 years as an expatriate performing, and many people thought he did some of his best work in those years. He died in the late 80s. He'd occasionally make an appearance in the U.S. Uh, Now, heroin use wasn't legal in Amsterdam, but in Amsterdam the attitude was, well, you seem to be sort of doing okay here. Um, We got better things to do than than to lock you up, so we're just going to pretend we don't see you doing this. And he knew that, so he was able to live the life the way he wanted to and play his music and be left alone. And so that's generally been the attitude throughout most of, most of, not all, but most of Europe for a long time. And I would argue that has a lot to do with why you don't see as many people dying. (laughs) Yeah. Well, we should talk about, I mean, the... The, the laws of economics are in play here, and, and if Milton Friedman were sitting with us, he would have easily predicted what would happen if Portugal decriminalized all the drugs because you, 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 you pull the rug out from under the illegal market, the, the, the market where you might get mm. adulterated and, and dangerous drugs. He allowed for um, people that wanted to get help to come out of the shadows because they knew they wouldn't go to jail. Um, he allowed for doctors that wanted to help them to come out of the shadows because they wouldn't go to jail. And it's it, it's sort of a natural sort of almost Hayekian process where uh, free people, even even free people that are ad- addicted to, to drugs, um, actually make better decisions when they're left alone. Absolutely, yeah. It's crazy talk, isn't it? it? Yeah, I know. All my conservative friends, please listen to this. You know, it's uh, interesting, the meth issue. Yeah. Uh, um, so... Here's another perfect example. In 2005, they weren't talking about the opioid crisis. They're talking about the meth crisis, and everybody was dying. There's a lot of meth-related deaths, uh, and there were a lot of. Basically, every community had these little homegrown labs. It was organic, where they were making meth out of Sudafed, which is easily converted to meth. 
So the government comes in, orders Sudafed to be behind the counter in two states, Oregon and Mississippi. They actually, the states pass laws making it prescription only. And Sudafed is a very good decongestant. So a lot of people who are allergy sufferers. I know. I get angry every time I have to fill out the government forms when I have a cold. Yeah, it really inconvenienced them. In the meantime, and then they had all these SWAT teams cracking down all these meth labs. And if if you looked at the CDC numbers, the meth-related death rate from 2005 to 2006 sort of leveled off. But then it started going back up again because that was basically the only drug that the cartels weren't interested in. They were mainly smuggling cocaine, heroin, and marijuana because there were so many homegrown labs all over the place. There was really no market niche available to them. Well, now that niche opened up. So within a year, the cartels started getting into making meth, and it started coming back into the country across the border. So then we leaned on Mexico in 2007 for them to make Sudafed unavailable. But by that time, you had these organized cartels invested in this new industry, so they quickly learned, I guess some of them watched uh, Breaking Bad, and they found out that you could use P2P, phenyl-2-propanone, to make meth. So they switched over to that. You should probably ban that show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so now it's back. In, two, in 2011, the CDC reported 1,887 meth-related deaths. In 2017, it was up to 10,200. Yeah. So that's going to be the next new thing we're going to be talking about. But... You know, President Trump's going to be very upset because we had all these great meth-related jobs in the United States, <laughs> and we drove them all to Mexico. The Mexicans yeah. took – we need American meth, and I think we should work to get American meth industry resurrected in this we country. We could probably get Walter White to be the spokesperson for good <laughs> good American-made right. meth. Made in USA meth. Yeah. yeah. Um, for those of you who are triggered, we are, we're are we joking. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, so, like, we've – the, instead, of course, we're, we're putting people in cages. Uh, we're putting patients in cages. We're putting addicts in cages. We're putting doctors in cages. Doctors yeah. in cages. Um, we're also, and I, I want to read to you this this um, this story that I was that I found this morning on in the Guardian. Uh, we're also going after drug companies. We're oh, going yeah. after people producing uh, the very types of painkillers that that made. Um, made such a difference in my life when I was having surgery. And, and the Guardian headline is, Opioid Crisis, FDA's own staff demand agency halt approval of new painkillers. And I don't, I don't fully remember anymore the process, but there's, there's these two uh, FDA uh, experts that are basically saying that um, the FDA has been negligent by by approving new painkillers because they're just ignoring the the opioid crisis, and I had an experience where um, you know my the the first painkiller and I you you can correct me because you probably know exactly what they did for me. The first painkiller I had that wasn't doing the job was was some form of of morphine, and they eventually moved me to Dilaudid, mm-hmm. and it worked better. And it also, and I, I, had, I had multiple surgeries, so I was able to sort of hack my own pain management experience. Uh, morphine was a miserable experience for me to get off of. I, I had all sorts of uh, uh, withdrawal symptoms. I didn't even know what they were at the time because I'd never went through an experience like that. But before. you weren't addicted. You were, you were dependent because right. otherwise you would be still trying to get sure. some from me right now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> my reaction was, I don't want to do that again. That's so, dependency. So, so that yeah. was, it was clearly a dependency and I went through like sort of a miserable 48 hour period where where I was depressed and anxious and and even hallucinating uh, I didn't have any of that experience in a, in a in a more recent surgery when when they used Dilaudid it worked better and I didn't have anything that felt like like a withdrawal to me and but now the FDA is like no we can't have any innovation right. in painkillers that's just straight up evil yeah it's evil and it's also and I, stupid, I or yeah, I mean, maybe it's more stupid than evil. I don't, I can't tell. It's sort of like uh, you know, I could see Hugo Chavez or uh, or uh, Maduro uh, coming up with something like that. How yeah. could you presume to know we have enough painkillers? Yeah, or enough of this type of painkiller. And would you, by the way, would you des- describe? Is very common, and a lot of a lot of it we in in science don't understand yet. But there'll be. Uh, 
uh, Dilaudid is hydromorphone. It's about five times the potency of mor morphine, milligram for milligram. Uh, and it's about twice as powerful as heroin, which is diamorphine, which is available in a lot of the developed world. It's, um, so um, it's very common to see one particular opiate or opioid either not work for someone or have some unpleasant side effects where another one doesn't. But th that could be exact opposite experience for the next person. So you can see another person who morphine works great, but the Dilaudid gave them terrible yeah. feelings. Yeah. And so there's, because there's, there's several receptors besides, we know of at least five receptors in the, in the central nervous system that these opioids interact with, but there are probably others. And again, it also has a lot to do with what other medicines may be in your system and their interactions and your own physiology and your kidney function, et cetera. So it's very common to see patients who, you know, one combination of pain relievers doesn't work for them and another one does, and the exact opposite kind of story for the next patient. Yeah. Which is why, as doctors who are trying to help people control their pain, we need to have as many options available as possible, not right. as few. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly the, what my doctors did, is they we went through this process together and at the time, this is a while ago, this is before the, the Trump administration has really cracked down on, on, on doctors, they, they were able to basically eventually get it right. But my understanding, and particularly in the context of, of today's conversation, if I end up in the hospital tomorrow and I tell them Dilaudid really worked for me, aren't they like not allowed to give it to me specifically because I asked for it, or can I still do that? Not to my knowledge, it may, it may be different yeah. In different states or in district, district of Columbia, uh, w within the hospital setting, is, that's not a problem. It's the main problem is when you get out of the hospital. Okay. So, okay. Uh, now many states, including my own, are putting restrictions on how many days supply of painkiller I can send you home with after your surgery in the hospital, because apparently the, the politicians know better than the patients or the doctors how many days that person is going to need relief from their pain after that operation. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I, I actually tweeted out in response to Senator Gillibrand that um, I'm impressed that Dr. Gillibrand and Dr. Gardner seem to know how many, just how much pain relief the entire U.S. population needs when I've been practicing medicine for about 40 years and I still can't figure it out. So maybe I should go to one of their meetings and they could explain it to me. Yeah. So so let's wrap this up. Uh, the the conference that you just hosted, people can go to Cato.org. Um, you've also written a number of things for Cato mm -hmm. that 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 gets into a lot of these issues right. that we've touched on. Which they can see at my bio page at Cato. It's all yeah. all the links to those things are there. Good, um, but let's let's talk about. Uh, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist about the future of of, of shifting the paradigm away from prohibition and punishment and, and caging addicts to to harm reduction and actually using science and the people that actually know what they're doing to solve these problems? Um, I, I actually, I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, this thing has, you know, fits and starts, um, but uh, I, in these last few days that I've been in, in, in D.C. as well, I've met with lots of staffers uh, from across party lines, to, you know, con Congress people's offices and senators' offices. Um, I think... More and more people in the policy world. We even had our conference, somebody from the White House in the audience and somebody from ONDCP, the drug czar's office. I think more and more. To, uh, they, they were taking it, names. Is what well, they were doing. no, I think I'm, everybody's I'm coming to the realization yeah. that, you know, this isn't working. You can't, the numbers aren't lying. And, yeah. um, and, and so, but there's this tension between I know this isn't working and I know harm reduction is a better way to get less people dying. But then... My uh, my biases tell me, but that's a bad thing for them to do. And they're back and forth. So it's not going to be like a straight line. It's going to be just like with the stock market. It's going to be a jagged up and down. Yeah. But I think it's trending in the right direction. And just like with medical marijuana, think of how long it took to get medical marijuana to the point where now almost every state has a degree of medical marijuana. That took years. Yeah. And then um, after— And something just clicked, and now it's And now it's we're seeing recreational yeah. use. Because once people saw, you know, we were— we had it drilled into us since the 50s and 60s that, you know, one one puff of a marijuana joint and you could become a crazed lunatic killer. 
That's what they were telling us in Reefer Madness. And now you all of a sudden you say, well, I know a number, my, you know, my aunt is using medical marijuana. It's controlling her pain from her chronic pain syndrome or her cancer or whatever. And, you know, she didn't become a crazed killer. She's not running through the streets naked, acting crazy. Then she's normal. Actually, I didn't even know this guy from work. I didn't even know he's using medical marijuana. He, didn't, he seems kind of perfectly lucid and functional and he just let me know about that i had no idea so as that's happening all of a sudden now people are getting open to the idea of, well why does it have to just be medical then we see that why can't it just be legal like we are with alcohol and i'm hoping that as more and more people start to adopt those uh, harm reduction for the other drugs that are illegal the same thing will start to happen as we see you know this guy he goes into the safe injection site twice a day, he injects in a safe sanitary environment, then he goes to work. We get along fine at work, he's a good coworker. Uh, I understand he's got a habit, but uh, sure doesn't affect any of us at work. Why are we making him have to do that? Why can't he just buy it? And that, so I'm hoping that's where things will move towards. It certainly has that potential. Well, I look forward to reading the comments on this particular podcast, but thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Singer. Uh, we're going to check out your stuff. I really appreciate your time. It's been great being here. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.